Hey, everybody. I'm Bill Calkins, Senior Editor with Grower Talks, and I'm assuming if you grow poinsettias, you currently have crops in the greenhouse right now, which makes today's webinar quite timely. As we're joined by representatives from Selecta One for a discussion about our favorite seasonal crop. This is the second in a three-part series about poinsettias, and today we're going to focus on the heart of poinsettia production from pinch to bract development. I'm excited to be joined by two experts who've grown plenty of poinsettias over the course of their careers and now represent Selecta One working with growers across North America. And get this, believe it or not, both of our panelists are in Chicago as we speak, traveling there to evaluate summer annuals trials at Ball, but have no fear, they are socially distanced and joining us individually. Our first guest is Gary Vollmer, who brings decades of industry experience propagating, growing, selecting, doing just about every horticultural job imaginable. And with that experience comes tons of great stories and lessons. So how are things progressing for poinsettia growers this season, Gary? You know, uh, despite the, the, the craziness of uh, trying to get a, a cutting from uh, various places around the planet, delivered into the North America, it's actually going pretty well. I would say uh, we're solid, the numbers look good, uh, production numbers are consistent, um, and you know, no major, uh, no major problems to, to date. Excellent, excellent. And next we have James Dukas, who covers a big territory for Selecta One and also has plenty of greenhouse experience and tips and tricks to share with growers. James, how are things looking on the East Coast and Great Lakes this time of year? Well, things are beautiful. It's just a little steamy outside. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, it sounds good. <laughs> Definitely hot. And I'm excited to get started with the webinar. So before we actually start, I do want to share a couple of uh, little bits of housekeeping for, uh, for the audience. Um, first off, as always, this webinar will be archived at uh, growertalks.com slash webinars, along with many others, including the first webinar from this mini series. And as soon as we're done today, this webinar will also be archived. In addition, if you have questions during uh, this webinar for the panelists, as we move through their presentations, can you just post them in the Q&A section? Our panelists might see them on the, and answer them on the fly, but most likely I'll come back in at the end and uh, do my best to get these questions to the panelists so they can answer all of your questions. So at this point, gentlemen, uh, I think that I'm going to just hand this over to you and sit back and listen as you guys drop some poinsettia knowledge on the attendees today. And uh, so it's all yours. Take it away. All right, off we go. All right, can everybody see the screen? We got a. All right, right we're good. All right, so uh, thank you guys all for joining us. Uh, I appreciate you. If I look a little shiny, I've been uh, sweating out in in, uh, in trials this morning. Um, what we want to do today is 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 pick up where we left off on on webinar one and uh, start with the, the the pinch, and we'll work forward from there. Um, topics we'll cover are pinch review, uh, go through moisture, you know, water, fertility, media, sort of the basics of the triangle, the, uh, of the basics of growing. We'll get into disease control, insect control, and we'll talk about the different environmental factors. We'll take a deep dive into humidity and, 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 and how that can affect us. Get into, you know, height management and spacing product specs and all that fun stuff and we'll take you right up through initiation. So that's kind of the line where we're going to draw webinar one and we'll pick up from there in webinar two. So that being said, we're going to go back and do a review over uh, on the pinching. So it's, it's really important uh, to, to note and before we get into the pinching, I just want to do a little explanation to everybody about why a point set of branches. So those of us that are old, like myself, that have been around a long time, remember when the Hegg series was brought to market. And the Hegg series was a breakthrough. Prior to that, we were growing poinsettias, um, straight ups mostly, because they didn't branch. But what the Hegg's brought to us was what we call phytoplasm, which is a, like a little bit of genetic material that, that you can get into a plant, and that causes them to branch. So 
the modern poinsettia is a combination of breeding to allow the, uh, you know, the poinsettia to grow well and then to allow the phytoplasm to express itself more. And then also just through selection processes of, of uh, finding better phytoplasms. Phytoplasm is introduced into a poinsettia genetic after the breeder crosses it and creates a seedling and then he grafts it onto another poinsettia that has the phytoplasm. The phytoplasm transfers across the graft then we grow it out and, and evaluate the plant. So what has happened is if we've rolled through to what I'll, you'll hear me refer to this term modern poinsettia. What that modern poinsettia does, it has a, uh, a plants that are bred to react to the, the phytoplasm better. And also through time, we've made selections of, of the uh, rootstock that we graft onto that are better branched. As a result, poinsettias today branch much better than they did um, in the past. So old school pinching schedules and techniques need to be evaluated. So really one of the key things is about when, when you actually pinch and why. So you wanna pinch early, um, earlier than used to. It used to be right to the points, right to the roots or out to the edge of the pot, going down the side of the pot, and then you do a big hard pinch and then the breaks come up. The problem with that strategy with the modern poinsettia is the poinsettias will branch even if you don't pinch them, but the problem is they branch from the bottom up. They branch not based on proximity to the pinch, they branch based on age. So the older leaves, these older shoots will form first. So then what will happen is the shoot will form at or below the soil line prior to the pinch and try to become equal dominant. So it's really important that you get the pinch done before that lower shoot tries to take over the plant. So we typically say 12 to 14 days. The reality is what you're looking for is active root growth. Um, depending on the media that you, you're getting from propagation, um, you wanna make sure the roots are regressing aggressively out of that propagation medium into the soil and the growing tip is released. In other words, if there was PGR in there, which I like in liners, um, it's starting to move. So once it starts to grow, once that plant becomes active, then you can talk about pinching it. And you may want to wait to, just because uh, depending on the, the nature of, of the spec you're trying to achieve, to get the leaf count you want, you might have to wait up to maybe 20, 21 days, but I would never pinch later than 21 days. If you are in a situation where you can't pitch on time, when you do pinch, train your people that are pinching to look for those shoots that might be breaking from the bottom. And when you do the pinch, remove those shoots so they don't become a pole dominant. They will definitely mess up the shape of the plant. So again, don't leave too many leaves. That's the thing. other thing about this thing is you want to leave, I say one, no more than two leaves beyond what your target bract count is on that plant. Every leaf is theoretically a branch. The problem is, is if you wait and pinch late and then you do a kind of a, a, a pinch like you see in this picture here that's not really a hard pinch, you end up leaving a lot of nodes behind. And, and what ends up happening is you end up with too many bracts and too many bracts can be as big a problem as not enough bracts. So too many bracts will really crowd the plant and you, you tend to get botrytis, the bracts aren't as big. And your height control varies if, you're, if your branching isn't consistent from plant to plant the ones with less uh, branches or, or less leaves left behind will be much more aggressive than the ones with more branches. You're basically taking the same energy, spreading it over less shoots versus more shoots. So it's very important that you pinch consistently and again, pinch to one to two leaves behind for what you want. If, you, if you're selling a five bracted six inch point set, you leave six to seven leaves behind. When you pinch, it's really important that you keep the humidity high so that those shoots, especially the ones near the top, near the, 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 the pinch point, are in a, a tender environment so they actually will, will break and form and grow. So what we often like to do is, is if you don't want to put a lot of water on the, on the crop, water the aisles, water the ground around the crop, quick passes with booms. But basically what you're trying to do is create a high humidity environment to, to support the development, the early development of those shoots. So here again, this is a review from uh, webinar one, 13 days, ready to pinch. There's a nice pinch on a point set. It's not a old school hard pinch. It's not a soft pinch. 
um, it's sort of what we would call a medium pinch. And that's really the kind of ideal area for these newer points out of genetics. Now, if you're growing some older varieties, you might want to pinch a little bit harder. Gary, where do you uh, settle in on leaf removal after a pinch? You that's a very good point. So, so if you are in a situation, let's say you want to pinch the crop because you're, you're ready to pinch and you don't, and the timing in your, your scheduling says that you should pinch this week. And perhaps that, that cutting isn't as fully developed as you would like it. And you need to leave um, a shoot behind that isn't a expanded leaf. You do a soft pinch. So you take the tip out, but then what happens is, is the hormones that, that trigger apical dominance reside in those upper undeveloped leaves. So if you are going to take a softer than normal pinch, let's go back to this picture here. You can see the leaf was removed on the situation. And what that does is when you do a soft pinch, you can remove one of those top undeveloped leaves. That just helps to balance the hormones out throughout the rest of, of the liner. So here we go. So it's 13 days, plants pinched. So ideally what you want is seven days after that, you want to see these breaks come up. And again, this is uh, a Christmas Feelings, which is a very, very free branching variety. And you can even say, I pulled this plant. Now this wasn't normal in that crop, but I pulled this one up to show you that even in that 13 days after transplant pinch, you see on the left there, that one shoot near the bottom trying to become dominant. That one's not so bad that we, 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 you would just use a little early PGR to even it out. But if that plant, if that shoot is up near the tip of the plant or higher, it should be removed um, ideally at pinch because you would be able to see it when you go to pinch it. And this is uh, a crop again, uh, pinched, and you can see that's what you're looking for. You're looking for this nice little lime green cluster on the top. And then um, as those begin to progress and grow, then we can start talking about our, our, our early PGRs that are about leavening out the plant. So again, getting that pinch right and getting those early PGRs on to, to even out the bracts will help um, to do that. And we'll talk about the PGRs more. So early cell applications. Um, if you're in the south and it's warm, you can use B9 cells for this. If you're in the, uh, you know, mid-level um, up, unless it's really, really hot, I prefer just Psychocell. Um, you don't want to really stunt anything right now. All you're doing at this point is you're evening out the architecture of the plant. Spray, uh, PGR sprays, particularly both Psychocell and B9, enter through the foliage and they affect the shoots that are more dominant um, more than the ones that aren't. So by doing this light sprays over top of the stage, the, the shoots that are becoming more powerful, they have more leaf surface, so they're getting more PGR effect. That allows the smaller shoots to catch up. So you never want to do any kind of drench this early. And even I'm not a fan of using bonsai as a spray this early because it will go into the stems and will affect proximity. Whereas the B9 sex cell, if you light, light spray over the top, it's just going to drift down and affect the leaves it touches. And again, what we're doing here is not controlling the height, we're controlling the architecture of the plant. And just to mention, you know, when you talk about light, uh, a light spray, volume becomes a, a situation here. So we're talking about spraying to glisten, right? We're not talking about right. dripping stuff down. So drips in this situation, a light spray would be bad. Absolutely correct. That's a very good point, James. What you want to do, and, and, and technique-wise, one of the, the methods you do is you crank your pressure. You, if you have a variable orifice, you, you make that orifice fine. And then the other thing you can do that just kind of helps is have your applicator orient the, the tip of the, that sprayer up so that the, 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 the spray doesn't go directly on the plant. It falls onto the plant because we're not, this is not an insecticide spray or fungicide where we're trying to penetrate the plant and get control inside. We are simply trying to lay a little coat on the top leaves. Okay. Good point, James. Thank you. So again, I showed this picture in the first webinar. This was a little fun experiment we did a while ago. I did everything on the plant on the left. I did everything I could think of to do wrong. I pinched it really late and I bonsai drenched it right away. The plant on the right was pinched on time and used um, uh, some cycle cell applications to make it nice and even. But this is what, you, what you're trying to achieve. 
you the market expects the BRACs on top of the plant. And now is the time, this very early PGRs and pinches is where we have the most influence on that presentation of BRACs on top. If you don't do that right, you end up with the panel on the left. Whereas if you were going into a, a, a BRAC count spec scenario, only those three on top would be counted. So that's why it's so important right now in these early stages in a pinch crop to get this pinching and early PGRs just right. Okay, James. All right, so we're gonna start, uh, start with uh, moisture management, all right? Right now, consider it, uh, you got your cutting down, um, the liner's been planted, you got your roots into new media. We gotta build a nice base and foundation. And the way we do that is keeping even moisture, all right? So we're trying to get from our, our left pitcher where we're just rooting out, we're doing a little bit of a pinch. Right now, we're looking towards developing some older roots into the middle here. And then finally, of course, when we get closer to finish, we should have a nice, healthy, thick root system. Yep. All right, some do's and don'ts. So just like I said, we're, we're building on a, a foundation. We want to stay in the middle of the road on moisture, okay? Uh, being too wet because uh, you don't want to go check the moisture later in the day is, is not acceptable. You're going to drown out all the air the roots need and, and the free space they need to grow into. Okay, this is not a time. I know it's hot out in the greenhouse, but you got to try to get to a nice schedule where you're checking in the morning and you're checking uh, probably right after your mid morning break and then early in the afternoon. We want to try and get the water on early in the, uh, as possible. That way we're avoiding any overhead watering late in the day when it's extremely hot in the foliage and we're burning off potentially with the fertilizer tips causing phosphorus uh, deformation all sorts of issues, okay? Not, not to mention late watering jacks your humidity le levels up. And when we and get that past would be pinch, a major concern is you controlling your humidity as yeah. your canopy begins to close. All right, I think, and that's a way of keeping uh, disease control, but we'll, we'll uh, touch on that a little bit more, a little bit later. Um, and also make sure you're not gonna be the one seven days a week watering, right? So make sure that you, you and your, your growing team or, or your, uh, your partner there uh, that's helping you check a couple times the weekend, you're speaking the same language when you talk about watering and water weight of a pot, all right? And, you know, for example, just go out with the grower and, and yourself and pick up pots together, all right? So you guys can compare and yep. know. This is one of the ways, especially growing uh, mums and poinsettias, I really like the medium moisture scale that way we can say, hey man, I know what a three is. Yeah. Um, and, and that was really Will Hilly's uh, developed for growing plugs. But in this situation, it, it's a uh, good language to also use in a finished pot. All right, we wanna avoid growing a dry. Excessive dry downs, just like being too excessively wet, um, can damage and cause a shock and then allows pythium and other root diseases to go into the root system. Yeah, I would, I would I, you know, I'd have to say that I would say the number one cause of pythium in poinsettias is, is a hard dry down. It stresses oh, yeah. the plants and, and they're, if you know poinsettia roots, you can see they're nice and big, thick and fleshy. And as soon as they dry down, uh, they, they die, they fry off. And then you have these dead roots. If you do dry down hard, do not go out there and go, oh crap, they're all dry. Let's water them really, really good and saturate them. That is just a, a recipe for, for root disease. If you do have a severe dry down, and I define a severe dry down on a poinsettia is the leaves are flagging hard. If the stems are wilting, we have an old saying, if you wilt it, you kilt it. So you never want to let a poinsettia wilt. You can let the leaves flag a little bit, but if you get into a point where they're hard flagging or they're wilting at all, I would recommend that you hydrate them and immediately apply a pythium targeted fungicide. Personally, um, you know, I think Segway is the best rescue product out there for pythium, but um, I think, but the, the other thing is, is the consistency. I think that's so important that, that you be consistent in your water. If you're growing a little bit on the drier side, that's okay. If you grow a little bit on the wetter side, that's okay. But you don't want to go dry on Tuesday, drowned on Wednesday. That's just a recipe for pithy. 
yeah, that, that's easy way to cause issues gotcha. right? gotcha. and destroy all the work that you've done to this point. And then you're going to spend uh, much more money on your crop doing recovery. And then that'll later get into issues as your root system isn't established. You're, you'll start to worry about your height because you won't get the uh, shoot growth that you're expecting and that you need during this time after the pinch. Absolutely. I, I think this is basically um, phase one of a theme you'll hear repeatedly uh, today is that your best approach to managing your disease issues are managing your moisture in your environment, be the moisture in the media or moisture in the air uh, versus becoming, you know, addicted to a chemical approach. Poinsettias are sensitive and they're easy to mess up with chemistry too. And uh, especially you mentioned the point of the hard dry down uh, that's going to occur in summer. So you're going to have a summer type of pythium going through, yep. which in that case, I know a lot of people have been used to using subdue max, and this is the type of time where, you know, you want to go more with the true band because there is resistance to a summer pythium with subdue max. Yep. High temperature pythium. Um, there are other strains that are resistant, but typically high temperature pythium strains that are active in warmer temperatures tend to have more resistance to subdue, which is a good point. I think subdue is, is still a viable product. I think uh, I've been you know, using that chemistry my, pretty much my entire career. Well, literally my entire career on various crops. And I don't wanna see us lose that chemistry. So the, the, the thing that we can't do is if we treat and we see pythium and you treat with subdue, then you have to come in with an alternative chemical to kill that pythium. If you don't, you just go hit it again with subdue, all you're doing is rendering a stronger and stronger resistant population. If the subdue is failing, rotate. Even if it isn't failing, rotate. Because this is a great chemistry. It's been one of our most cost-effective um, root disease products and we do not want to lose it. And right now in certain regions, we just can't even use it on the poinsettia crop. We can't lose any tools on the chemical side. Yeah. They're just not being replaced fast enough and they're not new modes of actions, especially for drenching. It's just, yep. as the world progresses, um, it becomes more expensive for the chemical companies to give us new tools as growers. So we have to make sure that we use the ones that we currently have as effectively as possible and increase the longevity of their shelf life. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, so the ideal irrigation method I would recommend would be drips. And, you know, you can either go with a drip tape because that'll also automatically give you your spacing. So you can space it out as long as you create a nice header, um, you know, beginning wise. Or if you're trying to do multiple pot sizes in a greenhouse on a certain run, that's where I would go to more drip tubes. Uh, but at the same time, if you already have drip tubes, maybe it doesn't make the sense for you to invest in drip tape uh, for the year. You know, mm -hmm. you're going to have to make that decision on your own. But those are the benefits of both and why as you get later into the season, uh, especially for controlling uh, uh, any moisture in the canopy, uh, that's why I, I prefer drip irrigation, right? And at the same time, again, as you get later in the season after the pinch, everything and every leaf you unfold um, more of the time when you get into late September, you can see that damage if you have any fertilizer damage from overhead watering. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the phosphorus phenomenon is, is a real issue. It's an issue that I know you and I talk about every year because we deal with it every year. I think the other point I want to make about the drips, and again, I'm, I'm like James, I'm a total hardcore drip poinsettia finish guy. But the other thing I would suggest is if you look at your drips, the type of drip you use, an old school high flow chapin is not ideal in the situation. You want a metered flow uh, delivery, either a metered flow uh, emitter on, on the pot or a metered flow through drip tape. That allows you to use the tape for, for drenches, especially PGR drenches, where volume is equally as important as the rate. So if you're going to use any kind of PGR drenching, it's it's really by far the best solution to put it onto a controlled flow, you know, one GPH, half GPH, whatever it is, but a controlled metered flow type of emitter. And that's not to say that sub irrigation is bad. I, mm -hmm. I used to use flood floors uh, uh, for my finished crop latent season all the time. The, the, you just have to be cognizant of 
when to use your flood floors and the humidity that will be remaining as you use it and make sure that you're using that on days where you're not going to be stuck in clouds the whole time, right? Yep. So use your, you know, use what irrigation system you have. They're just benefits uh, to using drip. And there's also, um, you know, as anything, there's pros and cons. So I'm going to, I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell a story. And if you're, if you're listening, um, I apologize. I won't name you, but this is a story. This is one of the concerns you have with a flood floor on, on poinsettias. Um, uh, one of the common rotations prior to poinsettias is growing mums. So this grower was growing a large uh, 10 inch pot mum on this flood floor and he was, it was warm and they were getting big on him and he started spraying bonsai. He was spraying bonsai at 30 to 50 parts per million regularly. And as he started shipping out of this, he continued to spray. What happened is that spray got onto the floor. In comes the poinsettia crop being spaced right behind that mom crop on that flood, on that floor, and then he flooded it and that bonsai released into that poinsettia crop and they never moved, not one, not an inch. So be cognizant in a flood floor situation that what is on that floor, if it is soluble, is in the tank. Or if it sticks to the floor, it might wick right up through the roots. So just be aware of what's on the floor. We deal with a lot of growers that also grow vegetable seedlings. And we have very strict non um, drench, non bonsai protocols for these guys because they can't risk any of that, that, that you know, bonsai um, getting into their flood system or onto the floor. So that is one of the things about floods. But if you're, if you're on your game, the other issue with floods is you have to make sure you have proper sanitation and you don't have an active pythium population. Because again, another grower, if you're on the call, I apologize when you won't be named, lost a huge chunk of poinsettias over a weekend due to a fact that the uh, sanitation uh, system for his uh, recovery tank failed and he flooded repeatedly with Pythium water. And as a result, he lost probably 20, 25% of his crop on a weekend to Pythium. So flood floors are very cost effective and a lot of guys use them, but be careful. There's a few caveats there that can burn you. Mm -hmm. Yep. So talking about water quality and fertility, uh, you want complete fertilizer options. Uh, your main fertilizer, 17,517 is recommended, you know, a calcium uh, nitrate based fertilizer, right? And a constant feed of around 200 to 250 is what we would recommend, as well as maintaining a pH of a 5.7 to a 6.3. Generally speaking, using um, a 17,517, depending on your water source, that pH will drift up over time uh, in the life of your crop. Uh, because that'll push it a little bit up. If you need to recover uh, some uh, height or you're, you, for whatever reason, uh, you know, you're a little bit stalled and you need some shoot expansion uh, and elongation, use a push feed of a 2010-20, right? So a little bit extra phosphorus pushing you up, a little bit more uh, readily active nitrogen going right in at that time. And, you know, know your uh, water pH so you can match your fertilizer program. You might need to add some acid injection to kind of balance it out. Know what your water quality is and match it for your, uh, your fertilizer. Yeah, it's important too. I think what's important to understand is uh, the influencers of, of pH in the water and pH is not the issue. pH is a, a, a snapshot. pH can be buffered and unbuffered. You can have water with no alkalinity or no bicarbonate in the water at all. Pure water, distilled water, you can take 10 gallons of, of distilled water and move the pH a couple of tenths with you know, uh, a, a few drops of acid. But you take that same water that has bicarbonate levels up around you know, 350, 400, you could you know, dump you know, a half a gallon of acid in it to get the same movement. So pH is, is, is sort of the measurement. Uh, just imagine it's temperature versus heat, right? Alkalinity is the, 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 the real thing that's, that's going on in the water that's buffering and making that water want to be, or your media, want to be at a certain pH. And the feed 
if you have a modest alkalinity, it's really nice because you take something like a 17517, which is a virtually a neutral feed, and you can say, all right, now the feed is not so much an influencer on that. Over time, it will drift up a little bit. But if you're going in, you know, with something harder, like a 13213, that's definitely going to move it up. If you go in with a 201020, that's going to move it down. So there is, in addition to, you know, what you want to do with the feed, there is that influence of, of the, the buffering in the water. So that's something that I would encourage you guys, if you're not comfortable with water, definitely reach out to us. We can help you work through that. For sure. Yeah. yeah. All right. And as any long-term crop, you need to get comfortable with some sort of regularly scheduled media testing. Mm -hmm. All right. So you maintain a, an EC of a 1.5 to a two for a pour through method or a 0.9 to 1.3 for a one to two uh, saturated paste mm -hmm. method. Um, and a healthy growing poinsettia will use a lot of fertilizer at this point, right? Yeah. We're, we're, we've gotten the shade off of it, hopefully, or increase the light levels as much as we can, given our greenhouse structure that we're using. They're going to use a lot of feed. Wow. I think one. I think one of the things you want to watch here too is, yeah, I like to to, to track the media, um, but if the plant is growing actively and you know, and I say no by actually testing, not believing your injector, but you know you're constantly feeding, um, and your P in your media EC goes down, don't get worried. The plant's just taking the feed up. So it's equally as important to measure the, the, the EC in the media, but also just while you're out there, just check what's coming out the feed line. Make sure you know what is actually going in the pot. Many times, every year, I run into situations where everybody's going, I don't know why my plants are going yellow, I'm feeding it. And, and they literally had a situation where, you know, yeah, I'm feeding it, I'm feeding it. I'm going, no, and I had to go out and literally put my meter on their feed line and go, uh, no, you're not. Just because you hook the hose up to the, 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 the line that has a red mark for the feed line doesn't mean there's feed. Prove it, right? So yeah. use test. that same meter that you're checking the EC for, use it on the, the feed use line. On, you're on the feed line. So you got to know what's going in because sometimes what will happen is, is you'll, 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 you, know, you, you don't want to freak out from a low EC if you know that you're getting the feed, that you're getting that 2, 250 constant and the EC is dripping down below one. No worries if you know it's getting fed every irrigation. If you're an alternating feed to clear water guy, it's a little more complicated. That's why I like constant feed. For mm -hmm. sure. And this is a good time to plug uh, the fact that you should calibrate your EC meter every once in a while. If you don't know the last time that it was calibrated, then that means you need to do it now. And you should look at calibrating your injectors. Somewhat critical in nutrition, but hypercritical in growth regulation if you're gonna drench with PGRs. Yeah. Uh, and of course, don't forget to add a little bit of molly uh, and deliver one PP, uh, point one ppm with each fertilization, right? There's a lot, a lot of, lot of uh, you know, uh, high quality soluble feeds will have it in there. A lot of, uh, there's more set of versions of different formulations, and that's pretty much what they're doing is they're kicking up the molly a bit. If you don't have that, it's easy enough to get sodium molybdate and throw a little bit of wind feed. It's not going to cause any incompatibility issues with um, other products. You don't want to go heavy on it. It doesn't really cause too much damage to the plant, but molly is not particularly safe for, for you. So be careful with it. All right, so just kind of an example of what you kind of would expect with a pH and EC monitoring schedule here. You can see the crop was stuck week 32. Uh, your EC uh, started to go up a little bit on week 30, uh, 33, but now that you've been feeding out and you have roots actively growing out and taking up the feed that you're putting on, then it's going to drip down a little bit as it's sucking everything up that you're putting on. And, you know, I wouldn't be too concerned, but just continuously monitor it, right? You want it, it will gradually drift up a little bit as we get in later into the season, right? Because we're not going to have that high influence of the light levels as well as the temperature starts to wean off and growth rate slows a little bit. So it will probably go up a little bit around your week 40. But this is a kind of a general, uh, this, you do not need to hit these specific targets, okay? But these are a, a general rule of what you would expect to see in a monitoring program. And the other thing too, I think this points that, that the absence of feed tends to see the pH drift upward a bit as well. 
So that's just sort of a, a phenomenon that, that happens as well. I wouldn't necessarily lay, let a high pH dictate your, your feed regime, but we'll get into, and in, in, in webinar three, we'll talk a lot about why it's really important not to let the pH get too high, but in, in, in a nutshell, it's magnesium. Um, so we'll get into that in the next webinar in detail. All right. We've Disease gone on. Time, James? Yeah, yeah, I, I get you. Pretty for, pictures. Yeah, a bunch of pictures, all right. <laughs> so we have a bunch of finished disease control, right? Um, so you can see the probably the plan on the left here, that one cutting, either fungus gnat uh, introduced some pythium into it, or it maybe has some rhizoc kind of going through at that base. That's why you would check. There on the far right, you do have a liner that has some rhizoc and some wet it, webbing on it. Oh, and then uh, in the center there, you definitely have botrytis attacking that stem in the canopy. Yep. A lot of diseases like poinsettias, that's for sure. And, and, and they can be very, very aggressive on, that, uh, on the stems. Oh, yeah. We just have a few slides about specific diseases and some, um, you know, recommended chemicals and, and strategies to mitigate those. Um, so we have, you know, rhizoc, it's going to attack right at the soil line. You, generally, you're going to see webbing. A lot of times it's misdiagnosed as pythium, right? So you got to see where the damage is actually occurring. Um, and, and not all the time will you see the webbing, right? Yep. Um, but generally speaking, you, you will, and that's a telltale sign. Yeah, I think another thing, you, you know, like say typically when, when growers see a plant collapse, they just assume that it's pythium. So if you see a plant collapse, you look for some sign of rhizoc. Um, the, the lesion's usually low on, on the stem, usually never more than an inch or so above the soil line. But oftentimes an early lesion will appear as sort of like a medium brown blister on the stem. Um, that can happen before it girdles, but inevitably that rhizoctonia pathogen will girdle the stem, cut off the flow, and, and the plant will collapse as if the roots failed on pythium. But it's real easy. Just take a look at the roots. If your roots are intact and the plant collapsed, whether you can see a clean lesion or not, it's probably rhizoc, and you may have to peel, plant, peel back that plant uh, to get down and dirty to see it. If it's botrytis, it'll be pretty obviously botrytis, and that usually occurs higher up on the plant. Do not be afraid to sacrifice one cutting or one stem uh, in order to prevent a larger scale outbreak from going through your crop. If you see plants that show significant disease symptoms, it behooves you to do the due diligence to identify the pathogen and know what you're dealing with. The, one of the most common mistakes I see out there is rhizoc is present. Rhizoc is taking down the plant. Their grower sees plants collapsing. They don't look close. They go, oh, I got pythium loose. All right, I'm just going to throw, uh, you know, a nice pythium fungicide on there. Well, guess what? It's a different kind of pathogen and different fungicides work on it. And you can throw all the subdue or true band you want on a rhizoc infection. It's going to just do nothing. So you really need to take the time. I love dissecting plants. Um, I find, you know, get them, pull that plant out, rinse off the roots, look what you know what you're dealing with. I think that's the important thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so botrytis um, generally will happen in an attack when at this particular stage when you're when you haven't spaced the plants out yet, mm -hmm. right? You're building up that humidity and that microclimate between all those leaves and those new stems that you have. It's one of the uh, issues with if you pinch too high and you have too many shoots, you have all those extra shoots, but you also have them each unfolding extra leaves and creating an even denser canopy uh, than you would have traditionally have, right? And this, again, this, we'll get into this when we talk about environment. This is um, a difficult microclimate to manage is the unspaced pinched poinsettia. The, the tissues are soft and the airflow that the, the leaves expand. So you pretty much create a, a damp bubble that, that most, a lot of environmental influences can't penetrate. Even HAF can't get into that bubble. So um, in that situation, you may have to lean on chemistry, certainly reducing humidity. In that situation, I honestly would say that you wouldn't want to go with a uh, spray. You wouldn't want to go with more of a sprench, right? Paint the stems. This is not folio botrytis. Excellent point, James. This is not folio botrytis. This is not late season botrytis, which hits your leaves or your bracts. This is stem botrytis. 
this is, and this is a big issue in poinsettia. It, it, just like this picture, it attacks the stem and, and, and the stem collapses. Botrytis is insidious because it not only is a stem disease, it's equally good as a leaf disease and a devastating BRAC disease as well. So yeah, very good point, James. Mm -hmm. And our, our favorite pythium, because we continue yeah. to bring up pythium here. <laughs> uh, and it often follows fungus gnat infestations or cycling of hard dry downs, like we said earlier. Um, and, and a good point is look where the pythium is occurring. Yeah. Okay. If it's on the outside of your root system, generally that speaks to a hard dry down or poor cycling of yep. moisture. If it's occurring at the interior and working its way out to what would have been good roots, then that's leading towards you have a fungus gnat infestation that wasn't really dealt with. And the larvae is chewing at the base of that cutting, allowing it to start and work that pythium work its way out. And that is, I think that's so critical to your management strategy to understand what's going on. Cause um, you see both types or both types of infection occurring routinely and, and, and the strategies are, you know, are different. The, the, the outside in means you need to go and the first thing you need to do is go attack your water management. But the inside out, your water management might be fine and you're forced to think about chemistry, be it, you know, to a, to, if there is still active fungus nets, make sure you get them out because those suckers are living that base of that cutting and just chew away and chew away all the way through to the end. Um, so yeah, it's really, really important to understand. So this is the, this is my, poster child for dissection. When I see a pythium pot and I'm working with growers, what I like to do is take that entire plant right down the stem, split it wide open, soil ball and everything, and just look at that inside filet. And you, what you're looking for is you're looking for any kind of browning around the base of the cutting, or oftentimes you can see little tunnels that the fungus net had. And then you look at the root health. Is the roots worse? in or worse out. So it's really important with Pythium that you try to understand why you got it, because that will certainly affect your strategies. Uh, just again, I, I don't like to, to call out specific chemicals um, because a lot of them are effective and I'm not in the chemical industry, but I have to say Segway is my favorite. If you have a Pythium problem, I don't think anything is, is uh, more effective at controlling an active pythium problem. I think there's a lot of good uh, preventative strategies, but if you have an outbreak, I'm a Segway guy. And, and this is where me and Gary, we slightly differ. I totally agree, very curative. <laughs> I, I enjoy, or at least did, uh, putting Segway on later in the crop as a preventative because I didn't have as much splash up or at that time, you know, any residue that was gonna be on leaves that would have been seen from an application, right, of going in and through. Um, and this is one of the ones where I would generally go with more of a true band at this time, right? A dual action. But either or, you know, Pepsi Coke at this point, right? As long as you're doing something and identifying that where your problem is originating, that right. is really the key. Yep. Again, I guess the point is, is there's more than one ways to skin that cat. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So powdery mildew, this is not as, as major as an issue um, as na uh, across the continent as, as other uh, diseases and also in other crops that we see. I mean, such as verbena and calabacoa, and that's pretty much universally across North America. Um, but powdery mildew, it can attack free space uh, when the canopy is closed in. It, generally, we see more of it every year. Uh, Gary, where, where do you generally see powdery mildew kind of pop up? You know, the, there's, there, there's two places. You, you'll see it um, further north early around um, in that tight canopy time. Um, but where, you, where I really see it the most is sort of towards the end of the crop uh, in the south when the environment starts to transition and humidity levels start to, to, to perk up in the house. And yeah, I mean, as a... A pathogen in poinsettias, I'd park this as a clean, a clear number four, right? Pythium number one, um, I would say Botrytis number two, Rhizoc number three, Powdery Mildew number four. But when it gets loose, it's a bugger. So 
if you're, you know, the best control is clearly environmental. Um, we'll get into that. But if you see it, treat for it because it will spread rapidly and it, it, it can be pretty devastating. It, it's not one you see all the time, but when you see it, you usually see it. And when you do see it, it's usually pretty darn bad. So just keep your eyes out. It's very easy to spot. Can't miss it. Uh, so we have a bunch of, you know, in here, we have a bunch of charts uh, with some recommended recommendations as far as uh, disease control. You can also find this in the back of the selector catalog uh, as part of the crop culture with the same charts, as well as we have charts uh, that you can find online. Yep. And we have charts for biological control strategies as well as for traditional chemical control strategies. And I have to tell you, um, uh, you know, a call out to Ontario. Growers in Ontario have uh, abandoned a lot of chemicals on their point set of crop. And, um, you know, I was, I was, show me, show me, I'll believe you when I see it. Well, I've been watching this go on, uh, you know, for a long time up there. And I will tell you that biocontrol strategies for both root protection and, and uh, uh, white flyer and, and fungus net control and, and other insects are very, very effective. Um, I find the, the, the place where you run into a problem with a biocontrol strategy is foliar diseases. It's very difficult. But I will tell you that, you know, uh, a lot of uh, biological things you can drench into the soil or have incorporated into your media can really do a great job uh, uh, controlling pythium. Also, I think it helps with nutrition. And of course, uh, for, for white flag control, a good, aggressive, early established, well-managed bio program will render you well in control and bio programs have no resistance. So that's another and argument. I would say just the point on the bios and not putting people towards a bio program, but if you are biological curious about it, um, point set is a good crop to uh, uh, experiment with, right? Because My curious, huh, James? Nice. Biological curious. <laughs> you know, you know, you've been doing chemicals your whole time, and you're like, eh, the nematodes kind of work for me. Let's see what other things work. And uh, this is one of those long-term crops where you can actually build up a population. You can use the biologicals a little bit longer. It's harder to justify for someone that is is turning and burning spring crops uh, to experiment with biological control. Absolutely, poinsettia is a good crop. To, to play with bios on because it's a long-term crop. But let me tell you, you don't dabble, especially with insect control, we'll get into that in a second, but you don't dabble. You're either in or you're out because if you dabble, you'll have a very poor program and you'll have to come behind it and hit it with a chemical program. So you're gonna have to pay for both. Yep. So you gotta do it. There's a lot of good people out there that are really good at this in, in different regions. So if you're interested in Generally, they're also very warm and welcoming to questions. Absolutely. Um, so. If you're serious about getting into a bio program, either for disease control, especially for insect control, reach out to the experts. They know what works in the different regions and in your particular pathogen or pests and pathogens. So. Sorry, I didn't, bugs. Yeah, I didn't, sorry, Gary. I didn't mean to make you like spit up your water there. Um, That's all right. You spilled on my shirt, man. <laughs> Fungus gnats and shore flies continue to be an issue at this stage, right? As we're, we're growing out from a pinch. Um, so just, you know, these are what to see on your sticky cards and identify differently as far as the larvae are concerned and the adults. Yeah. The, you know, shore flies are a, a, a nuisance. They'll literally crap all over your leaves and, and things like that. But the, the fungus gnats, the one that in, in, in poinsettia that's devastating because they just love poinsettia tissue they'll eat any part of a poinsettia the stem. I think they prefer callus, but they'll eat roots, they'll eat stems, they'll eat leaves. I've seen in direct stick situations where the leaves are touching the media, just devoured by fungus gnats. So they, that's the difference between a fungus gnat and a shore fly. Shore flies are a nuisance, fungus gnats are a serious problem. And as we talked, you know, the fungus gnats uh, in our previous one on propagation, you know, they feed on the roots and the callus and they bacteria pythium for you. Um, your best control is sanitation. So if you have a mum crop or a fall crop of solotia or, or, or ornamental peppers or anything, clean up the area before you space into it. No slime, guys. No slime. Slime is not your friend. Algae breeds fungus gnats big time. Clean yourselves. Clean your floors. Sanitation is critical in prop. 
because fungus gnats getting loose in crop go out with the crop into your finished areas. And they're not just flying into the plants, they're already in the plant. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. And IGR insecticides, of course, work early uh, on the larvae stages, right? As, as, as well as uh, in, the, in the bio arena, uh, nematodes work really good. I really love nematodes, but you have to understand a nematode's alive. So you have to create a living environment for that nematode. They can't be too hot. They can't be, uh, they can be destroyed application methods. You can't run them through, a, 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 like you can't drench with your, 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 your sprayer because that pump will shred the nematodes. So you have Air to use- injector, make sure your screen is off. Yep. You, you know. you, so, and don't, don't dry down hard. So if you keep a moist environment and you're careful with your application method, nematodes are great uh, uh, fungus that control. But I'd say at least half the people I know that are applying nematodes are not doing it right and they're not getting efficacy, if, if good efficacy or any efficacy at all, frankly. And I would say that the people that are not getting the efficacy, they should be getting they're applying a little too frequently because of how they're managing their crop. This is another thing that plays into media moisture management. You want yep. to keep it uh, moist, but not too saturated. And also a hard dry down kills your nematodes. Kills, so, kills them dead fast. Yeah. So again, nematodes are very effective and, and, but you really, it, it's, it's not a game for somebody that doesn't have a lot of good control. If you don't have that kind of good controls, then I suggest you go down a more chemical path if you have fungus nets. But the number one control method is clean up your greenhouse. Keep it clean. And sticky cards, buddy, sticky cards, sticky cards, please use sticky cards. And white fly, uh, you have your sweet potato light white fly, you have your sweet potato white fly QB biotype, which is why when you start to see populations that aren't responding to any of your chemical applications, we recommend reach out to your extension agents and you know take some samples to them and let them identify. You'll be surprised uh, your your local extension agents uh, might be more than willing to come out and visit you. Uh, they don't necessarily get live specimens and uh, interesting things. You'll have to forgive them. They uh, will probably be a little more excited than you will be. You'll be angry and upset and they will be excited on new specimens. So, you know, it, it, it's, I think you can visually identify a Bamesia from a greenhouse or a banded wing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and we'll get into that here in, in, in the next slide. But you cannot identify a Q or a B biotype from your standard uh, Bamesia. And because these Q and B biotypes have resistance and they also have different reproductive things, uh, aspects to their life cycle, we're not going to get into a QB biotype. That's a whole other session. But the point is, what you if you see Bamesia, I would encourage you to find the resource where you can send that and they can identify if you have a QRB biotype, because it will affect your, your control strategy. For sure. So your general greenhouse white fly. Uh, old friend. Yeah. So again, uh, uh, notice it's, it's got a, a wider, whiter leaf and a little, uh, so a little bit different morphology on the eggs, but you got to have a hand lens to identify that. Sweet potato, silver leaf, uh, white fly. You notice the difference as far as the larva stages, uh, the eggs and, and the wings that you're looking at. So if you look at the... Yeah, look at the picture on the right. That picture shows on the left of that picture is a, is a, is the sweet potato white fly, and on on uh, the the right side of that picture is a greenhouse white fly. So you can see the sweet potato white fly's wings are narrower; they're more translucent. Thus, you kind of see the yellowish green of the body, whereas the greenhouse white fly has that broad, really white, non-translucent wing. So it's pretty easy to identify one versus the other. But when in doubt, send, send it, it out. Send it out. You got it. And your banded wing white fly, uh, banded wings, kind of in the name. Yeah, it, it's it's you know this is a regional thing. Um, weird pockets. We see it in in in. Originally, it came out of uh, uh, like Yuma, Arizona, and those kind of areas in vegetable production, and it was moved up. 
and it's hit a lot of agricultural crops in California. I've only seen it once on a, on a poinsettia crop in California. We also see it up in Ontario, I think coming out of the, the grapes or the peaches there too. But it, it seems to be spreading out and being that we do see it in Ontario makes me think that it's something that could exist in most uh, climates. Um, so keep your eye out for it. It's very easy to identify. And I would say um, it's, it is not as difficult as uh, something like a B or Q biotype, but it's definitely something that you need to control. And it does actively feed on poinsettia for sure. So control strategies, scout, scout, scout. All right. Scout, scout, your, scout, 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 scout. And then do some more scouting. Uh, keep a log of your white fly count so you can monitor whether they're going up, down, sideways. And, you know, it sounds like I'm, I'm echoing a lot of monitoring. And honestly, that's what you're doing with a, a poinsettia crop. It's a that's how you do it. Crop. You need to monitor it, right? It's, it, there's not a four-week life cycle of, of it being in your greenhouse. Um, it's generally, what, 12 weeks? How, how long are we talking about here? You know, 12 to 16 for most people. Mm -hmm. You know, monitor it. Get, you know, use Excel. You, yeah, use sticky cards, use sticky cards. I really get frustrated when people tell me, I, 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 I think I've got a white fire problem. I'm going, well, how do you know? Well, I see a few flying around. Well, how many are you capping on your cards and how far apart are your cards? Well, I don't have cards up. Okay, put some cards up. Now, one of the other things you can, that you can do that I really like, it's a, it's a technique I like. I'm not a, uh, I don't like to throw a lot of chemistry around. And if you start clean in a lot of places and you don't have outside pressure, you can kind of stay clean. And the way, only way you can stay clean is you need to know and, and monitor. And if you see a white fly or a couple of white flies on a card and you don't see them elsewhere, put more cards around that card because you probably have a plant that is infested. And if you can zero in, on where that population exists, then pick that one, four, five, six, eight plants and throw them in a garbage bag and then throw them in the dumpster. And then you may not have to treat it. But if you don't catch the hot spots, they're going to spread and spread and spread and spread until at some point in time, it's like that, that COVID commercial with the ping pong balls and the, and the mouse traps. Once you get enough of a population, it explodes geometrically. Whereas if you can isolate these little hot spots and treat them, you can prevent that explosion. So I, monitor scouts, find out where it is. Uh, that's the best control you've got. And generally speaking, a lot of our greenhouses are in uh, rural areas and uh, we share the land with uh, next, next door neighbors that are farming some sort of crop, um, soybeans, uh, yeah. So when your farmer goes to harvest here, uh, be cognizant of that. Close your vents, because those white flies, they're not really good flyers. They're not gonna go around your greenhouse and in the other vent, but they will go from a harvested soybean field mm -hmm. and try to make it into your poinsettias. Yeah, we see that beans, beans yeah. are a crop where they come from. Uh, the worst scenario I've ever saw ever was organic cotton where they sprayed to defoliate the cotton and the cloud of white fly that attacked this greenhouse was devastating. We see it in, in um, uh, California a lot with strawberry fields too. It's the end of the season, they're done harvesting, they, they, they won't rip them out and they don't do anything and they just leave them in the ground and the white fly just explode. And then when they do go out and decide to, to disc that field, then the white fly comes flying in your greenhouse. You can see the use of uh, the, the wide sticky tape and guys where you have a lot of pressure from outside it's a good idea to either um, on the posts on the vent wall, um, right in ideally right in the middle of the vent, uh, put that tape up because not only can you use the yellow tape to monitor, you can actually use it as a control uh, parameter to reduce the introduction of white fly coming into your house. Um, I like to tend to kind of think of white fly and building resistance the same way we talk about spider mite control right, and the ability for spider mites in successive populations to develop uh, a resistance to the chemistry that we're using, right? I know that RICAR isn't, isn't allowed in, in parts of New York uh, and has a limited label in certain areas, but it's, it's shown to be extremely effective, um, especially as we get later into season, uh, and it doesn't appear to uh, have major phytotoxic uh, toxicity concerns, right? So that's the one where, okay, if I know that's the case, 
I would plan to use that later in my crop cycle as opposed to earlier and use other chemistries earlier. We can go deep into that. Uh, I think you, you, we don't have time, but what you want to decide amongst yourselves uh, as, as a grower, one of the questions you have to ask yourself, am I going bio, am I going chemical? Then the subset of, am I going chemical, am I going neonic free, or can I use neonics? Because that will affect your strategy of how you treat going forward. Yep. As we had with the, the diseases, we have these charts for bio control, uh, both in our, uh, in the catalog and on the website. Gary, your environment for right now, and I get to interrupt you. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> James and I interrupt each other all the time. We have a lot of fun talking on the phone. Hey, I got to try and get at least 50. <laughs> yeah, if I can get 40% of the conversation in, I'm doing all right. <laughs> so <laughs> active environment, I think that's the key, the key word here. Um, when we say active environment, what does that mean? We want transpiration. We want stomates open. We want water flowing through the plant, into the air, and out of the greenhouse. That's what we're after. That's the ideal growing situation. So you want higher light levels. If you have high light levels and low humidity, your fertility has to match because they're going to be growing actively. And that's, that's what we call the butter zone. That's where it's really good. So again, the most important thing you have to understand is transpiration is a factor of, of light level, temperature, and humidity. Stomates open more when the humidity is lower. The plants transpire more um, when the humidity is lower. So it's important to do that. But the plants also are going to drive the humidity up. So you have to make sure you're ventilating to, to manage that. And we'll get more into that uh, as we talk about humidity more. So finished environmental factors, again, temperature, light, humidity. Those are the big three that we're dealing with here. Um, we look at ADT, um, and that's just average data temperature, and so you, you, you have to pay attention to that. Without, there are extremes of high and low that will limit the, the, the growth, but the average daily temperature is sort of a barometer of, of your growth. So you can apply it with warmer nights or cooler nights and warmer days. But in that, you bring diff into the conversation. So as there's differences between day and night temperatures, that can affect the, the elongation of stems, but also can dramatically affect when and how humidity spikes, which we'll get into here momentarily. Um, light intensity, poinsettias like bright conditions. Um, transition them if you're going from shade and you're removing shade. Try to figure out a time that you can do that if you want to remove it early that you're not going to shock it. Sometimes you can get a little scorching. You can also get some just stress on that plant that they haven't been used to that harsh of an environment and they won't um, move quite as quickly. In transitioning from the higher light level, do you find it um, do you find it helpful to also say the middle of the day cool the crop down with a uh, with an overhead just clear water application? Very fine overhead clear app, uh, water application. I would say do it sort of early middle of the day, not in the heat of the afternoon, but going into the heat afternoon to try to create more transpiration going to the afternoon. Even clear water on a really hot hot leaf, especially down. In Texas, um, you can scorch that leaf even with fresh, clear water, especially if your water quality isn't ideal. If you have any kind of um, um, EC in that water, it could definitely cause some damage in the foliage. And Just, I would say as a person that has done this before, keep in mind that water that's in your pipe is going to be at a higher temperature because it's sitting in that warm greenhouse the whole time. So make sure if you're going to employ that strategy, you empty and check the temperature of that water or the very oh. least put your hand under it before you put it over top of the canopy. That, that, that's, 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 you brought that up because I was out watering some plants in a trial yesterday that were starting to wilt because I'm dragging them all over this place off the drip lines and I go to water that plant and I just realized I just dumped, I don't know how hot, but it had to be like 130 degree water on that plant. And I just went, ooh, I probably killed that one. But yeah, I did not take the time to flush my hose. It's a very good point. And if your pipes are above, um, especially uh, if gray PVC, Gray PVC will get hot. So yeah, you might have to blow some water out to, to, to be careful. But if you're going to put water on top of the plant, you definitely want to make sure it's not too hot. Or conversely, later in the season, too cold either. Yep. Temperature is ideally, you know, we're talking uh, 75 to 86. Uh, you know, everybody, in the, the guys in, in Southern California, they just chuckle when I say stuff like this. Anyway, yeah, 86, right. How about 120? 
you know, <laughs> but you, you, you want to try to go for that, the, the middle zone. Poinsettias can tolerate a lot of extremes, but in extreme heat, you see, oftentimes see strap leaves, or in some cases, uh, like what we call a bear paw, it almost looks like the leaf is just jagged and doesn't move, and they just don't grow. Um, that's usually a heat and humidity. In heat and low humidity, they'll grow fine, and it's amazing. I've seen some poinsettias growing in the desert that I never thought would fare well, but they do. So hot, humid is really what you have to worry about. So in the deep south or even in the, in the Midwest, lower and upper Midwest on those hot, hot days, you want to make sure you're, you're doing everything you can to, to try to get the humidity out. And sometimes you just have to go along for the ride. Um, night temperatures, you know, 61 to 72. Um, I wouldn't go any higher than 72 if possible. Again, there are times when you just, you, you out temperature is 80, you're not going to get to 72 at night. Uh, so you're going to deal with that. 61 is not the bottom. You can go lower than that. But when you start lowering your night temperatures uh, relative to day temperatures, you start screwing around with humidity levels. And we'll get to that here in a second. Again, ADT is, is uh, uh, about your average temperature. So 68 to 73 average. That's your average daily temperature over the 24 hour cycle is ideal. If you're up around 80, you're getting too high. Anything over about 70, uh, 77, 78 degrees is not a positive to a point on it. It's starting to very incrementally limit its growth and cause stress. So again, you, can always, you can't always avoid that, but you wanna be cognizant of what your goals are. And then avoid dew point. Humidity. We need it when we pinch, we need it in prop, but as soon as those breaks are formed, we hate it. You don't want it um, later in the season, unless you're, like I said, in the desert or something like that. But humidity causes a lot of problems. It causes a lot of problems with diseases. And one of the main problems with humidity is a phenomenon called dew point. And I'm going to explain to you what dew point is and what it means. So there's a very basic principle Warm air holds more water than cool air, thus the term relative humidity. It's the humidity relative to the temperature. So this little graphics here are from an app that I encourage you to buy. It's a little app, free app called Dewpoint. And it's the best way to understand what's going on. So if you look on the, 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 the little thing on the left, you see that the temperature is 75 degrees, the relative humidity is 75 degrees. That means the dew point is 68.3. That means if that humidity doesn't change as the temperature drops at 68.3 degrees, you will start to get condensation. Whether you see it or not, it's happening. It can be microcondensation. And at that point, powdery mildew and botrytis get very happy. So now you look at the middle screen, you can say, all right, I'm going to hold my temperature at 75. I'm going to lower my relative humidity to 60. Now my dew point's down to 63. But now if you go over here and you see how important the temperature influence on a, you know, a, a basis has way more effect on the dew point than the relative humidity. You reduce that temperature from 75 to 68 and hold your humidity at, at 75, the dew point drops down to 61. So if you have environment controls, you can, uh, environment computers, you can set up purges and environment uh, humidity management to prevent hitting dew point. But dew point is very easy to hit. And here is the scenario that is, is the, the curse. It's the end of the day. You're done. The sun's not quite down yet. And you're going home and it's time to button up shop. So you button up the greenhouses, they close up. It's still warm in the greenhouse. You've been transpiring all day. Humidity has built up. And now you've sealed that humidity and in the greenhouse. Now, let's say it was, I mean, 75 is a very modest temperature for the end of the day in a greenhouse. Let's say it was 80. But your night set point is 62. And let's say your relative humidity was 75. You're going to hit dew point way before you get down to your heat set point. And then you're going to fight diseases. So, Okay, how do you manage that? If you don't have environment control, the best way to manage that is to ventilate aggressively to reduce the temperature and humidity before you put them to bed at night. That transpiration and evaporation that's happening in the greenhouse from all the water is accumulating humidity in the house. As you close, button that house up, boom, you seal it all in. You need to get that 
out before you button the house up. Yeah, you might run more heat because you cooled off too much and you're not carrying that latent heat through the day to save your heat bill, but you're also seriously reducing your, your disease pressure. So I encourage everybody to get this little app and start playing around with it. And the best way to play with it is to actually go out and either get, get a humidity man, man, monitor or have some sort of system to measure it, but go out and when your greenhouse closes up at night, type, plug those numbers into this thing and you can see how cool you can get in the greenhouse that night before you hit condensation. This strategy, this basic principle will prevent botrytis and, and powdery mildew more effectively than anything you can do. So again, do I also have to make a point here, Gary, as yeah. we're using more temperature uh, to control our poinsettias and we're, you know, to control growth at this stage uh, and we're employing, say, a morning dip. Yeah. This is where growers can get in trouble and they don't realize, oh man, I just, I just, put condensation on my leaves. I just hit yeah. dew Yeah, and, you know, in the morning, if it's for a short period of time, so if you not do horrible. Like two to three hours, it's not the end of the world. But not the horrible. real problem comes is when you sit like this first graph, and let's say you're looking at that first chart, and that's your reality, and that is a very modest temperature and humidity uh, uh, settings that as soon as the temperature, the greenhouse cools down to 68.3 degrees, which will probably happen like at 10 o'clock at night, you are now spending the entire night with condensation. 10 hours of dew equals germination of spores. So just keep my, that- My up. point on the dip would probably be if you're going into a cloudy day. Yes, absolutely. Just be cognizant of what you're dealing with here. And I think one of the strategies people do is, Hey, I'm just going to cool the nights down because it saves some energy. Okay, it's a great strategy, but beware, you can burn yourself really badly with this. Cold finish, cool finish. I love cool finish, but this right here is what I learned when I first played with cool finish. Hard lessons learned, and then I learned about dew point. So educate yourself on dew point. It's a great little app. I encourage everybody to play with it. It will raise your awareness of humidity and temperature in your greenhouse more than anything I know. Uh, light level, um, intensity, which is foot counter deluxe, quantity, moles. Intensity, you don't want it to be too high because you'll get too much infrared with that light, which is heat, which will warm the greenhouse up. If you could filter out your infrared and take the, 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 the active spectrums, that's great, but it doesn't come that way. We don't get to filter out the infrared. So even a poinsettia could take more light. It's the infrared from extremely high light. So that's why we tend to shade poinsettias a little bit. And then in the south, sometimes they keep a little shade all the way through. But it's really what the plant, it, it's not how it's applied in, in intensity, it's the accumulation of molds. I come from the Pacific Northwest, where in the summer we get great molds because we have really long days and very clear days. And in the winter we get no molds because we'll go, you know, for weeks and weeks without seeing the sun. So but the, the really what you're after, if you're going to pick a thing to measure, it's moles. It's the quantity of light. So intensity is, is really about temp, its influence on temperature. If it's too low, a stretch. But that three to 5,000 foot candle is, is a nice uh, consideration. Then, of course, day length comes into play around initiations. Hey, Gary, uh, we had a question on the last webinar about using um, LEDs, I believe, in propagation um, and the LEDs as far as finishing a poinsettia crop, uh, where, where do you kind of fall down in, in that? And do you see that more widespread? Well, you know, I think, um, honestly, the time of year you're propagating a poinsettia, an LED and poinsettia propagation, I think is just, it's, it, it's not necessary. Um, you, can, you don't need a lot of lights to, light to propagate a poinsettia. Um, so I don't think it's necessary. On the finish side, if you're in a dark gray area, you can use LED to supplement your light and get some quality in the light mm -hmm. um, to supplement the light. Also, LEDs are quite effective as a tool for either night interruption or day extension to, to manipulate your day length. So you can play uh, both games with LED lights. But as far as supplemental lighting and poinsettia propagation, you're in a time of year that you really just don't need it. And so I think it's, it's a waste. As a big guys that I know that do a lot of poinsettia propagation, uh, they vary, they 
do not turn on their lights regularly. The other thing with LED lights and propagation is, is uh, liners grown with LED lights require a lot more feed. Because as we talked about in, 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 in uh, webinar one, you have to be careful feeding a liner because of phosphorus and phosphorus damage. The LED, LED and props gonna make you feed more and then therefore you're gonna raise your, your, your potential risk. Um, so as the outdoor environment changes, so bring changes in the greenhouse. So you have to just pay attention to, to what's going on. Um, Again, the, 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 the goals don't change, but the environment around you is changing. So again, if you have environment computers, that's great. That, that, that makes a lot of these decisions yourself. But it's really important that you watch this and avoid these scenarios. And again, that first cold night is dew point heaven. So that first cold day in the fall is when you oftentimes uh, get dew. And I'm talking... If you see condensation, if you're seeing condensation on your plants or you see a cloud in your greenhouse, it's really, really bad because dew point is often invisible to the naked eye. So again, this is just really about uh, make adjustments based on what the outside environment is doing. That's the point of this. Okay, James, talk about specs a bit. Oh, yeah, yeah. So... No, as anything, know your specs of which height and number of blooms and finish width that you're trying to achieve before you go in to uh, your poinsettia crop. Um, you're going to have different customers with different specs. Um, we know that there's a customer out there that is notorious for having a ruler uh, anytime they receive a poinsettia cart shipment. And it doesn't matter how nice the poinsettias are or how full they are or how full in color they are, if they don't hit that height spec, they're going to reject it. So know what your customer, what their specs are and work towards that goal. And, and it's, it's so important because I've been growing a lot of points as in my career and I've dealt with both the guys that will measure your plant height and, and, and kick you for that. And the other one is rack count. So you know that if, if you're growing a floral spec and you're going to get good money for that, they would expect on a six and six bracts on top, not six bracts on the plant, six bracts on top. So it's important to understand what your targets are and that spec, what size pot, how many stems in the pot, what you're doing, that influences your scheduling. And again, we could go for, for, for an hour on scheduling alone, but I think the point of this is just to make sure you know what it is you're trying to achieve. And it's amazing how often people don't really know that. How do you make your specs? All right. <laughs> Have a conversation with your customer, you know, and it, it's not, Hey, you know, I, I want big and nice. That's, that's not what we're talking about. We, we work in uh, uh, a little bit more of the world of reality uh, and defined specs. All right. So uh, how to get the number of blooms. And that goes back to the pinch, which we talked about earlier and know your varieties. There are uh, physical limitations to certain varieties on what height spec they're able to achieve. And yeah. generally speaking, Gary can talk about another, I don't know, 10 minutes about this, but at a certain point, different varieties essentially will split when they hit a height, certain height spec. And those varieties were what we would avoid for say a larger 10 inch or 12 inch pot. Not every, not every variety, even though it's a slower grower and a faster finisher to color is acceptable for those larger pot sizes. Absolutely. And conversely, um, you want, if you're growing small pots, you want to grow genetics that are conducive to that. And then there's the other factor is seasonality. What is the week you want to sell? Are you selling in week 46? Are you selling in week 51? And that's where this situation is. This is in, in this whole series. This is where genetics really, really come into play. Finding the right variety that fits the niche that you're trying to grow to that's going to give you the spec and, and height and timing that you want to go to. And again, there are, uh, uh, there is a phenomenon when the poinsettia unfolds so many leaves, the, 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 the tip will split. So there are certain varieties that just aren't conducive to a long stem big pot application. But again, and in, that, that's, in that situation as well, they, they're not conducive to a single stem yes, uh, application as well. Yeah. That's a uh -huh. whole other enchilada. Straight yeah, there, there's many different specs out there. Know whether you're supposed to be pinching these or you want the, your customer accepts unpinched 
or you'll be making these single stems. Um, you know, this is the type, this is the type of conversation that you need to have with your customer that will be purchasing these. Um, generally speaking, there's not a lot of poinsettia production on random spec at the moment. Uh, no, in, absolutely not. And, and one of the new, one of the new things that's coming out there right now, and we've seen this thing explode in the last couple of years is mini poinsettias and it's a unpinched mini poinsettia. So if you, any of you guys are interested or dabbling or want to work with un, uh, minis, please reach out to us. I have some documents to support that and I'm glad to discuss uh, the, 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 the do's and don'ts. It's straightforward, but because every leaf that you have when you stick that cutting is gonna be visible at the end, you have to be hyper careful about um, um, damaging the foliage, even the slightest bit. And yeah, that is definitely, minis are the case where uh, we do recommend more of a direct stick application. Um, because that's really the only way to be able to do that. Um, and also make sure that, you know, again, back to the phosphorus tip damage, you gotta make sure that you are really good on your overhead at that point and have a situation where you can then somehow sub irrigate those as the roots come out. That way you can eliminate that sort of uh, risk potential, especially on a high density table or of like a mini, right? That's a lot of URCs that could be burned up and unusable. Um, there's many ways to track height. Uh, some people choose to use a graphical tracking system uh, with, with some software. Um, you can create your own with the digital photo log and weekly pictures. I generally did, you know, an Excel sheet um, just based on what I did last week, uh, what my t uh, heights were now, and taking the difference between the two to figure out how much I grew in a week. You know, and, and generally speaking, you're going to target uh, mostly an uh, inch to an inch and a half. Uh, anytime do you got, if you're trying to recover, that's when you're trying to get that two inch of growth, all right, or, or higher. I would generally recommend that once you get it, be realistic. Um, if you need to recover three inches, you, you don't want to do that to your poinsettia. Your, your nodes are going to be super elongated. A little look very wonky at that point. Uh, at, that's when you need to say, do an established plan of, I'm going to recover a little bit of my inches every week as opposed to trying to do it in one big jump. Yep. Um, I, think, uh, I think what's important too is use history. You, you know, keep, keep your records, those documents. I like uh, a stick, uh, just a large stake and you write on that stake, you mark, make a mark to the height of the poinsettia and then get and write the date. If you'd apply to PGR, you write that you applied the PGR and the date and then you take that stick and you, you write the, the, the variety and the pot size on that stick and you throw it in a box. And the next year when you come out and you grow that variety again, you stick a blank stick in to track what you did. And then in the pot next to it, you stick the stick that you had from last year. So then you know you have this barometer of where you were week by week, day by day. Um, so you have that history sitting there right next to you. So I always like that. I think that because you, you, you kind of remember what happened last year, that's where using, if you can use graphical tracking, if you have last year's records, that's a good thing to use as, as a reference. So it's always important to look at what, what you experienced before. Obviously, weather variables, different conditions are going to be in play, but at least it gives you some sense of what's going on. And here is a, uh, you want to space on time, but also the variety selection. Uh, depends on wh how you're going to prioritize your spacing, right? So, may, but I know we're gonna, well, at least in my regions that I generally service in the Northeast and Great Lakes, uh, mums are a huge crop. And generally what happens is people start shipping their mums and they don't get to their poinsettias on time. And that is an issue, you have to make it a priority. I know that we don't, we generally only think that we work late in spring, but at those large producers, I know people are putting in extra hours or coming in on a Saturday to space their poinsettias because you only get one shot at this, right? So make it a priority. Um, too late, you're gonna have tall, weak plants, all right? And too early, what can actually happen with some varieties going too early is they're gonna go laterally on you and go real wide. And these are also varieties that I would recommend that we space, right? At the same time, we maybe not pull up that ring quite yet. Because I've seen uh, in cases, and it, we have a wonderful series called Joy, um, when you space it a little too early and pull up that ring, the thing is so aggressive, it'll take up that space and then it'll grow around that ring, especially in some of the larger sizes. 
So it's one of the ones in particular. I don't. I won't pick on the other breeding companies uh, for theirs, but I'm more than willing to work with you on when you you should be spacing yours. Um, and then you know it, it's best to space as the canopy starts to close in because then we're creating that microclimate, right? As you start to see your your plants start to touch the other ones, and especially those leaves start to bend into the others, it's time to space. Get on it. And there, and then to the counter to, to James's point, one of the things that we've pursued in our breeding and, and, and aggressively is a very vertical architectured plant. That very vertical architectured plant is way more forgiving on your spacing timing. If you space early, it's not going to go wide. If you space late, it just becomes a height measurement issue. Um, but uh, a lot of guys that want to be able to, like on a flood floor situation, they want to be able to get the crop uh, propagated and then they're going to want to go out and space it opportunistically, um, these, these uh, more steeper uh, angled uh, genetics are more conducive to being able to be spaced earlier. Um, so that's something that a lot of guys are leveraging as well. And due to labor constrictions, it's okay if you can only put two inches and break things apart a little bit before you go to final space. It's better to get a little space and airflow around that canopy than just to wait and not do it. Mm-hmm. Again, it's 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 the it's how how good is the strength of the stems on the plant in the end. It's also as we talked about earlier, it is a recipe for botrytis uh, by not getting them spaced on time. So we're going to talk about PGR here real quick. Again, the floral sandwich. We'll just throw this in there just for fun. Floral is something that is used in in propagate uh, in, in uh, uh, pinching around prior to and post the pinch, and. I think it's very effective, but I don't think it's necessary in a lot of modern varieties. But I just want to point it out to you here in this picture, you see a slight delay, even the fact that these florals were applied way back at the pinch, all the way at finish, there's floral in that plant a little bit. So just keep in mind, there is this little PGR effect that's going to happen. Um, It's really not causes any real trouble, but I don't think it's necessary. And honestly, I'm about risk mitigation. And I personally feel that every time you pull out that spray rig, you're rolling with dice because, you know, there's something can go wrong. Every variable you throw at it is, is another thing that can go wrong. But again, there's no real negative to it other than a slight delay. Um, early PGR applications, again, we talked about the post-pinch applications. So these are the spray applications. It's very important that, that you only focus on these light sprays. In the north, five to 500 to 1,000 parts per million cycle cell is good. You don't want to go above 1,000 parts per million cycle cell because on these tender leaves that you're touching, they're prone to getting that uh, white ring around the edge that oftentimes will fade, but that yellowing or whitening of the edge, if it's severe, will cause actual necrosis. And then you start having burnt edges. So keep that rates down. You can repeat like every four or five days if you need to. If you're in the south and it's warmer climate, you can uh, 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 combine a B9 cell. There is a strong synergy with B9 cell. So again, for this purpose, for this application on those tender leaves, I would keep the rates down like a thousand uh, B9 and 500 cycle cell works, works really good. Beware of accumulation of B9 applications. B9 causes significant delay on a poinsettia. That's a fact. And if you accumulate B9 and you are sitting there, and I've seen this happen in Texas repeatedly, where you go in and say, all right, B9 sex cells rocks. I'm going to do it in prop. I'm going to do it post pinch. I'm going to do it all the way through. And I don't want, I'm afraid of bonsai. So I'm going to B9 sex cell. Then I'm going to stop B9ing. Yeah, okay, I'll stop B9ing 1st of October, but I've already put five applications of B9 on that plant. That plant is going to be dramatically delayed. So you don't want to just become a B9 sex cell junkie on poinsettias because of the delay factor. There's a point where you have to either go back to the straight sex cell or you have to figure out and how to manage the uh, the drench strategy. So just beware of accumulation of B9. B9 causes delay on poinsettias. So just beware of that. PGR for finishing, spray versus drench. Um, You know, sprays only early. That's a rule. Um, But for finished, I like drip tape or controlled drip emitters and using very low rates of bonsai drenches. And that is a whole nother thing we could get into in detail. And I would encourage you, if you want to talk more about PGRs, reach out to James or I. We will go into it in detail, but there's going to be a lot of conversation about that because there's so many factors involved. Basic principle, 
bonsai rates are very, very low. It's very, very effective in a poinsettia. You do not want to spray bonsai in a poinsettia. It will dramatically reduce your bract size and your leaf size. The drenches need to be applied in a very, very controlled volume as well as the rate. You're putting X amount of bonsai in that pot. You can do it at a higher rate and a lower volume or a lower volume and a higher rate, but the bottom line is it's a metered apply. It's not like I'm gonna spray to runoff and then the excess stuff I spray in the leaves is not gonna be efficant and now I'm gonna get into someone's efficacy because I'm spraying on the leaf. No, bonsai is going in the soil, so you have to know that you're putting on the rate that you want and that you're putting on a specific volume. And if you're going to do this, we're talking very, very low rates. We're talking, uh, you know, a 20th of a part per million to a 10th of a part per million. We're talking micro doses. Very, very careful. Do your math. Every year, somebody does what I call the decimal point error. They think they're putting a 10th of a part per million bonsai on and they put a one part on. And that's devastating. At the same time, if you're a recirculating foot floor operator, this is the time if you're doing any drenches, you change your valve. So that's going to any any leach out is going yep. directly yep. to waste. Yep. Don't want bonsai drench water going back in your tank. It's a even great, at that low rate. Even at the low rate, correct. All right, so you can see here, you can see this is just a, a, a visual demonstration of a couple of different um, applications. You can see the dates here, Cycle cell 750 ppm, three applications versus a October 5th, uh, one-tenth parts per million drench. So you can see how cost, and a tenth of a part per million bonsai is micro pennies per pot. So it's so, it, when you, if you can master the technique, it is the most cost-effective way to control the height of a point setup. And it does a very good job with one or uh, a couple of applications, depending on your conditions. But it's too volatile to get into detail here. So please reach out to us. We will gladly work with you on this one. One other just quick point before we wrap up, because I know we're out of time, is bonsai used as a spray or a drench at first pollen shed, right at or right before pollen shed, will help to lock the scythia onto the plant and will give you shelf life and prevent the scythia from shedding off the plant. So that's kind of uh, the, the it for the PGR thing. We have heat delay issues. Keep your nights below 75, very important. Light, pollate, light pollution is, is something we have to be very careful. Every year we see the situation where during this initiation period from early September up to like the 1st of October, we get light intrusions. It's very important. Day length manipulation is a way to uh, change the natural response of a poinsettia, make it come earlier with blacking it out or extend it by lighting. Um, so black cloth, or uh, lights, we had a question about when to start and when to stop lighting. So when to start, I find it way more effective to start early, as early as week 35, um, 34 even, because what you're doing is, is the days are starting to get shorter and shorter and that plant may not feel absolute short day, but it's feeling a shortening of the day. If you wait too late to turn your lights on, then you can confuse that plant and sometimes we'll see some weird responses. So it's better to turn the lights on early. When to turn the lights off really depends on when you want to flower that variety and on that variety's natural response. The same is true for, for blackout. So again, these are, these are detailed stuff and, and please feel free to reach out to get more uh, details on when to start and when to stop your, your blackout or your lighting to manipulate it. But for those that aren't really well versed at this, the very best solution is to find the genetic that is appropriate to the schedule that you're trying to hit. That is way easier to do than to try to manipulate with lights. So it's not a game for the weary. That's what we've got for this one. I know we ran a couple minutes long. Uh, Bill, do you want to try to get some questions if we want to, do we have time for that? Yeah, we actually, uh, we do. Um, we can run through a few of the questions here. Cool. Um, I will, I've been watching them. I think you guys have covered a good number of them, but uh, here I'm gonna throw a, throw a few at you that I see here in the Q&A. Um, what are a couple of reasons uh, the leaves uh, might become yellow just after transplant? 
Well, the first question becomes, um, and this is really important when you talk about nutrition and the, and the point says, where on the plant is that leaf yellow? If the leaf yellow is at the base, um, it can be a, a result of just a lack of light in the propagation and stress or early nutrition uh, problems in, in, in propagation. But if it, if it occurs after transplant and the plant is actively growing, you're seeing that yellowing starting at the bottom, that is what I would call your, we define as sort of an overall lack of nutrition. Um, nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, potassium will rear themselves in the lower part of the plant. If it's yellowing at the top of the plant and it's on the unfolding leaves, they should be lime green. They should be chartreuse colored, not dark green. If they're dark green, then your EC is probably through the roof and they're not gonna expand properly. So that new growth should be lime green, but as that leaves expand, they should become dark green. But if that leaf is not green, but it's actually yellow or, uh, and normally what you would see too, not only just yellowing, you would see the yellow as an intervenal chlorosis, a chlorosis between the veins where you can start to see that those veins popping through. That would typically speak to a macro element, um, most likely um, iron, or possibly magnesium, but again, there's a lot in those early developing leaves that's an issue. So simplest terms, lower part of the plant is an overall feed. You're, you're just low on your macros. On the top of the plant, you're out of whack on your minors or your pH is wacky. Great, no, that that I think simplifies it. Uh, again, it's probably one of those things that's best to, to ask an expert to come in and take a look and do a little bit of evaluation, but that gives some good guidance. That, that being said, the, 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 the best thing you can do with, with, with us as a support for you guys, and we'd love to support you guys, that's what we do, is get us a photograph. Because a photograph, it, it's so useful. If you, you know, the best thing to do is, if you, the ideal thing is if you just send us a picture, then we're going to hit you with, the first thing we do is we almost have an automatic queue of questions to ask you. So what's ideally, the EP, what's the pH, what has it been, and what are you feeding? Right, exactly. And if you don't, have the pH and EC, that's fine. Um, we'll encourage you to get that, but if you don't have it, then we'll have a deeper discussion about what you're doing, and we can probably zero it down even without an uh, uh, EC or pH. But a photograph, visual cues are so important to help us resolve these issues. Great, and that's a good reminder. Take photos when you have questions about your crop because you might need them in the future. Yeah. Next question. We uh, uh, love it. Yeah. Next question gets a little bit regionally specific. It's uh, from Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, they said we have high humidity. After the pinch, what's the lowest humidity percent that would be acceptable? Um, she said they, they might have sufficient humidity even without, without adding. Yeah, I, 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 I think so. That's an excellent, excellent point. And we didn't really get into that too much because there's two things you're trying to do. You're trying to, you know, add humidity, but you're also trying to mitigate stress. So even though you might have enough humidity to, to effectively be human, it may be so hot that it's stressing the plant out. In that case, um, that light, quick pass of the boom, just to literally cool the tissue down is the issue. But in a nutshell, you want it about 75 or higher um, uh, maintained in that greenhouse. But if you're higher than that, and you're in hot and stressful, it doesn't mean you don't want to throw water around. What you don't want to throw is a bunch of water around because then that's just going to grow fungus gnats and all this other stuff. But you can use a very quick misting as a, a method to cool the, the plant down. And that's a very common technique in the South. So thank you. That's a great question because we didn't cover that. So that's a really good one. Cool. Uh, how about, how do you feel about using 17017 for early crop cycle overhead feeding um, before the crops spaced under drip tape? I don't think you're going to get there with your phosphorus levels if you do that, unless there's a, a good starter charge in your media. Um, I, I, I totally say you definitely have to be careful with overhead phosphorus on, on the plant. I would in, 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 in I would encourage you to maybe consider going to something like a 13213 uh, because that low level of phosphorus typically doesn't cause any, any damage. But the best technique really, because at that time you want soft growth and active growth and 17.0 and, 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 and the 13.2 are not active growth feeds. These are hard, strong growth feeds. The best technique is to get the feed on and rinse it immediately. The, 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 what I, you know, what I see a, a lot of guys do is they'll apply the feed and then, and I mean minutes, 
within minutes before it begins to dry on the tip, rinse it off with fresh water. You don't need to do that all the time. And you could go to like 17017, but once a week, you got to give it a shot of phosphorus. Phosphorus is so important to that early development of the shoots and the roots that we see, you know, I call it phosphobia. Phosphobia is, is something we have to mitigate because phosphobia will keep your, your tips intact, but will render your crop not healthy. In this situation, I generally see people running a series of hoses um, from another area if they don't have a dual line system, right? So they have their clear water coming in from the outside area, and then they have another hose where they're feeding, right? That way they can alternate without having to purge their feed line or change their injector setup. I've seen guys, you know, like have booms in a bank. They'll have a guy that's hand watering. He's hand watering and goes down maybe three posts, and then he's got a boom with clear water on it, and then he just turns the boom on and lets it catch up to him. So yep. he stops the boom and he continues to hand water and then gets another three posts and he brings the boom. However you do this, the principle is straight, very simple. You do need to get phosphorus seed into them. If you can't go through the roots, then um, you have to go over top, then you need to rinse it immediately. Now there is a product, um, bio uh, fertilizers like Nature Source, for example, has a formulation of, of phosphorus that does not cause the kind of burns that we see with other forms of phosphorus. So Nature Source as a feed and propagation and as a early feed is an effective way to get some phosphorus in the plant over top without having any rinse. But it's a different animal completely. But it is very effective for that. I'm not advocating finishing an entire poinsettia crop with it. I think it's a little soft, a little too warm and fuzzy, but it is a very effective way to get some phosphorus in the plant without burning the leaves. Okay. No, I think that, that's good. That answers that question. Uh, how about one more? Uh, and I, I think that there's probably other growers out there with this question. Are you, are you excited or have you seen any uh, positive results from using Obtigo to enhance root systems? <laughs> Not quantifiable. Okay. Right? It's anecdotal at this point. Um, but it is interesting. I'll just leave it at that. I'm not going to, I don't stick my neck out until I know, but I, I've heard some, I've heard some things that are interesting, but I want to see an actual side to side trial before I have any real honest opinion. That's what I, I thought is let's wait and see some more, uh, some good trial data out there before we, uh, anybody moves toward that. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think that being said, uh, that's a principle in, in, in play for anything that's different that you want to play with. I encourage you to play and play freely, but do it on a very limited scale. This is not a crop that behooves itself to going out and rolling the dice with some a different strategy until you know what the response is going to be. There's a lot of things that can go wrong. It's a long-term crop. It's a high value crop. You're spending a lot of money in this crop and energy and oftentimes chemistry or bios. You just don't want to roll the dice too much on this one because there's so much, there's too much at stake. But yeah, and this pick is a, one pick a small place and play, man, for sure. And when we're talking about new chemistries, as far as fungicides are concerned that are being foliar sprayed or whatever, um, this is where I would lean on more of your chemical supplier and chemical company as being those sorts of experts in making sure that, you know, what you're applying is not phytotoxic to poinsettias. If they answer, I don't know, that's a clear indication where you don't spray it to the crop widespread and you do a little test plant. Absolutely. And that's what you do for this year. And then you have the tool for, you know, later. And that's not saying they don't know. I'm just saying like, if you have that answer, we're uh, unsure. You have to be sure in a poinsettia crop. Like Gary said, there's too much involved in it. There's too much, yeah, there's too much for, it's a sensitive leaf. And, and, and I think we run into this all the time and, and there's um, a lack of phyto testing across all species on products. And they'll just, you know, the labor will generically say, trial before you do that. If it says that, and if it, <laughs> then do it by all means. If you don't see poinsettia on the label, um, try before you use. Good. That is great advice. I think, uh, like you said, uh, great advice for, for anything you're, you're, you're planning on using in your crop. Well, Gary and James, again, thanks for taking the time to share all of your tips, tricks, and information. I think that the attendees uh, appreciated the dialogue. It's like listening to growers talk about crops, which I think uh, everybody really enjoys. 
So we just heard part two of three in this mini series. So uh, be sure to register now for the third part on September 9th, where our esteemed panelists are going to complete the series with the discussion about finishing the crop from BRAC development through to the final stages. Once again, this webinar, in addition to the other, uh, the first uh, webinar are going to be archived at growertalks.com slash webinars. So be sure to uh, stop by that page and, and find all sorts of great information. So I definitely want to uh, th thank you guys again. And uh, as, as we close for today, uh, let's, uh, let's give a, a, a wave to the attendees and uh, on behalf of our panelists from Select One, I'm Bill Calkin, Senior Editor with Grower Talks, wishing you a fi fantastic poinsettia season. Take care out there, gentlemen. Thank you, Bill. Thanks.